Well, we have talked about the Catholic Church as the body and bride of Christ. We've talked about the priesthood itself, the sacrament of holy orders. Now I'm going to talk about the Eucharist. The Eucharist, which the Church herself calls the source, center, and summit of the Church's life. Think back to the Old Testament, the book of Exodus. Moses and the chosen people are held in bondage in Egypt, a cruel slavery. Uh, They were forced to work very hard. Pharaohs started putting more and more pressure on them, basically trying to wipe them out. Moses, the mediator between God and men, turned to God, interceded for the people. And God then said to Moses, tell the people to take a one-year-old lamb. If a family is too small for a whole lamb, it shall join the nearest household in procuring one and shall share the lamb in proportion to the number of pieces people who partake of it. Now they were to sacrifice this lamb. It was a male without blemish. Those were the conditions and this is the paschal sacrifice. A male lamb, year old, without blemish. And God said they will take that, sacrifice that lamb, And then they are to take the blood of the lamb and they are to put that blood on the doorposts and lintels of their homes. And then that night, the night of the Passover, I will send a destroying angel. And that destroying angel will strike down the firstborn of man or beast alike in all of Egypt. But the homes of those protected by the blood of the Lamb, they'll be spared. And that's exactly what happened. The destroying angel came, and all of the firstborn in all of Egypt were struck down. But the chosen people who had obeyed God and Moses, who took the blood of that sacrificial lamb, put it on the doorposts and lintels of their homes, the destroying angel passed over, hence the Passover, passed over those, didn't strike them. They were spared by the blood of the Lamb. Now that is what we call a biblical type in theology. In the Old Testament, it's something that happened that points toward the New Testament. It would be fulfilled, ultimately, in the New Testament. Testament. The blood of the Lamb. Now remember in the last hour we talked about the priesthood, Jesus being the only priest. Every priest, whether members of the royal priesthood, the laity, or the ministerial priesthood, priest, uh, acting in the one only priest, Jesus. They make, we make present the sacrifice of the one who is both high priest and Lamb of God. Remember? We talked about the Lamb of God. Now we Harken back to the Old Testament. Fulfilled in Jesus, that sacrificial lamb. Ultimately, it's Jesus, the Lamb of God. The institution of the Eucharist. Holy Thursday. Jesus anticipating his passion and death. He institutes two sacraments on Holy Thursday, the priesthood and the Eucharist. Who instituted those sacraments? Jesus Christ instituted those sacraments. Now, Jesus is a divine person. Who instituted the Eucharist and the priesthood? God. Jesus is a divine person. He's God. He instituted those sacraments the night of Holy Thursday, the Last Supper, if you will. 
What is the Eucharist? Uh, it is, we know it, as the Mass, Holy Communion, and so forth. The word means to, to give thanks. What is the acceptable thanksgiving to the Father? The sacrifice of the Son. Everything has reference to that. Uh, the word Eucharist comes from a Greek verb, Eucharistine, to give thanks. The only acceptable, ultimately and absolutely speaking, the only acceptable sacrifice to the Father, the only acceptable thanksgiving to the Father, is the sacrifice of his Son. Jesus offers himself to the Father in atonement for our sins. That means from the original sin all the way through the whole scope of time and space till the end. All the sin of a universe. Jesus offers himself. And of course that offering, that sacrifice, is more than super sufficient to redeem, to save an infinity of worlds. Now, God could have snapped his fingers and effected redemption. He could have, easily. But he didn't. He did it that way. He did it the way he did it, on the cross. At the heart of the Eucharist is the sacrifice of Calvary. You can't get away from it. The heart of the Eucharist is the sacrifice of Calvary. It is the sacrifice of Calvary wherein the power lies. The power to forgive sin. And that's what it's all about. Why did Jesus Christ enter time and space? Why did Jesus, a divine person, assume a human nature and become like us in every way except sin? Why? One word answer. Redemption. We needed a savior. That's why Jesus became man. That's why the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. We needed a Savior. How did he save us? Through his passion, death, and resurrection. That's the Paschal mystery. The passion, death, and resurrection of Christ. That's a strict unity. You can't separate it out. On my liturgical calendar, Good Friday always precedes Easter Sunday. Right? You've heard me say it a million times, no pain, no gain. No cross, no crown. It goes together. I, I once did a, uh, a little series for EWTN called the Easter Triduum. Uh, they put it on television uh, every Holy Thursday, Good Friday, Holy Saturday. They have it on several times a day for the last several years. And it's about this reality of the Paschal mystery. That's what the Easter Triduum is about, the Paschal mystery. Passion, suffering, death, and resurrection of Jesus. And it's a strict unity. You can't separate it out. The triumph of the cross. We celebrate the exaltation or triumph of the Holy Cross. The cross isn't a defeat. The cross is a victory. Uh, the cross is not negative. It's positive. Take a look at a cross. Looks like a plus sign to me. That's one way to think of it. You know, that can remind you that next time you, every time you look at a cross, remember it's a plus sign. And that's easy until you're the one carrying it. <laughs> right? You know? Yeah, that, then, but you know, it's that, that's exactly when you have to remember it is a plus sign. It doesn't feel like one. It feels very negative, very heavy. But there's power in the cross of Christ. Paschal mystery. So, what is the Eucharist? All right, there's one priest. Jesus is the high priest. Jesus working through his ministerial priest. Jesus, through the ministerial priest, enters in to the sacrifice of Calvary and makes it present. It happened 2,000 years ago, right? It's historical. Yes, it is. Yes, but it's transcendent. Because it is a divine person effecting this mystery. It transcends time and space. Hence it is relative, relevant rather, relevant to every time and every place. So, at any time the Eucharist is celebrated, at any place in the world, what happens? Jesus 
through his ministerial priest, enters into the one only sacrifice of Calvary and makes it present in an unbloody manner. Do we repeat the sacrifice of Calvary? No. Uh, our Protestant brothers and sisters, some of them think we're heretics because we, they think that we think we repeat the sacrifice. And, and knowing um, some scripture as they do, they say, no, it says in scripture he offered sacrifice once and for all. And that's the truth. So do we repeat the sacrifice? No. We enter into it and make it present. That's different from repeating it. That's one sacrifice. But at Mass, Eucharist, we enter into it. Who does it? Jesus does through the priest, the ministerial priest. And we join with the priest. Enter into it, make it present. Power. Absolute, pure power. Most Catholics don't understand that sacrament, which is the source, center, and summit of the church's life. Whose fault is it? Yours? No. Ours. Listen. Somebody asked me not too long ago, Father, the mess in the world, whose fault is it? I said, our fault. I honestly and truly believe that all the mess in the world is the fault of bishops and priests. And I believe it with 100% certainty. Why do I say that? How could I? Well, you know, this is you, you think you guys are pretty important then, huh? Yeah, real important. And when we don't do our job, the whole world suffers because of it. Our failure in holiness results in incalculable suffering visited upon the church and the whole world when we fail to be what we are called to be. And what is that? Nothing less than the living presence of Jesus Christ. Jesus made present. He, how does he do that? He does it through the baptized, through you and through us. Priests and bishops as leaders, as teachers of the people, as governors of the people, meaning we serve the people we're supposed to serve. In that way, it's an enormously important thing. When we don't do that, when we give scandal, these scandals, okay, uh, admitting that I have nothing but compassion, even for the, these guys who are guilty, and there are some of them who are guilty, they all, but I, I have compassion, and look, except for the grace of God, there go on. I don't know how they do those things. I don't understand those, that, those, kind, those particular sins. I don't understand those things, but that doesn't mean that it can't happen to somebody. I sympathize with anybody's weakness. I, I don't want to judge anybody. I really don't. I want to be quick to forgive. That being said, can't let it go. Where they're guilty, pay the piper. You know, if you've got to go to jail, go to jail. I am not soft on that kind of stuff. But by the same t token, mercy. God is a just God. God is a merciful God. In the end, mercy will triumph over justice. But when we fail, it's a disaster. Much worse than when somebody else fails. In, in the army, if the general is on the enemy's side, he can do a lot more damage than if the private is on the enemy's side. Bad enough when the private goes bad and you know, sell secrets or something, you know, or the intelligence officer. But when a higher up person does it, much more damage. When one of us goes bad, it affects thousands of people. You know, there are a lot of people who are weak in their faith. Most Catholics are weak in their faith, okay? Supposedly, 75% of us don't even go to Mass on Sunday. <clears throat> so, you know, what are those people doing? Usually nothing despite what they say, oh, I pray at home. No, you don't. 
You know, oh, but I can just talk directly to God. Yeah, you can, but you don't. It's a bunch of baloney. Well, it is. You know, they, they, they say, oh, yeah, <clears throat> I, I confess my sins directly to God. Who told you to do that? God? No. Jesus said, whoever sins you forgive them, forgiven them. Whoever sins you hell bound, they're hell bound. I'm talking about Catholics here. Can you talk to God directly? Of course you can. Can you confess your sins to God directly? Of course you can and should. But as Catholics, we've been given a special blessing. We have a sacrament. With absolute certainty, you know your sins are forgiven. The other way, you may be left wondering. Perfect contrition is needed for the forgiveness of serious sin outside the sacrament. Imperfect contrition suffices inside the sacrament of penance or confession. You know what that means? What that means is perfect contrition, you're totally sorry for your sins out of great love for God. Most people do not have absolute and great love for God. They can't muster that. But you have to have perfect contrition in order to have forgiveness of serious sin outside confession. It's a special gift. In confession, imperfect contrition will do. You know what imperfect contrition is? You're not sorry for your sins out of love for God, but rather out of fear of hell. Now, that's not the right motivation. It's true. The right motivation is out of love for God. But if you can't muster love for God, fear from, for hell is not a bad place to start. <laughs> Right? I mean, let's face it. And that suffices inside the context of the sacrament. You go to confession, you tell your sins, you're sorry, you know, you have con uh, contrition. You, you know, you're not quite sure if you'll ever do it again. You say, I don't know if I can guarantee that. Of course you can't guarantee it. But as long as you have the right disposition, look, you hate the sin. I'm sorry. You tell it in confession, you receive absolution. You have 100% certainty that God has forgiven your sin. Only the priest can do that. Now, back to the Mass. The Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, the gift who contains all gifts, the power of God, moves over the sacrifice. And something magnificent happens at the heart of the Mass, the essence of the Eucharist. At what point is that? It's the point where heaven and earth stand still, where the angels tremble, where all hell shakes, the consecration. We know that the material, the matter of the sacrament of the Eucharist is bread, the host, and wine. It's unleavened bread in the Latin rite, which is most of us are, are in the Latin rite, the, the uh, Western church. Unleavened bread, it's, it's wheat and water. That's what makes up the, the bread. Plain wheat and water. No additives, no sugar, no that. That would be illicit and it could be invalid. One time I was teaching, when I first taught the course on the catechism, one of my students, one of the 2,000 plus students I had sitting in the auditorium was a woman about 80 years old. And she came to every class, sat right in the front, listened attentively, took copious notes, and became a gadfly to the enemies of truth. In her parish, they were making altar bread, which is a fine thing to do. You can do that. That's all right. But it was a Betty Crocker recipe. And that's not all right. It had vanilla, eggs, milk, on and on and on. And it, it was probably, almost certainly, invalid. What does that mean? That, that means no Jesus. It's a nice cookie, but it isn't the Eucharist. The lady knew it. She tortured the bishop, who was a good man. But she, she went and she said, and Father Carapi said this, he's your teacher, right? Yeah, well, yes. Well, he said that they said, boy, she nailed him, Cole. He had to call the priest in. And the priest got very angry about it, went on a year, didn't do a thing about it. The woman got a bunch of her cronies together 
and they went to a certain <laughs> they went to a certain um, canon law foundation which drafted a case in canon law about that thick. She brought her to the bishop, said, we're going to Rome, by the way. For years, because of invalid matter in the sacrament of the Eucharist, we've not received Jesus in the Eucharist. And, quote, we're mad as hell. He said, thank you for telling me about it. It was very kind of you to tell me, you don't have to go to Rome. He called the priest in, put him on leave of absence, threatened to remove his faculties, if he ever even thought about doing that again. He went on a long retreat. He came back repentant and apologized to the parish. Why? Because that 80-year-old woman listened to the truth, took it seriously, didn't cop out, wasn't indifferent, and wasn't a coward. Did what she had to do. That, oh, that's like a lot of the women in the Old Testament. Ruth, hmm? These were strong, saintly women. You know, the men don't want to clean up their act. Hey, the women will straighten them out. <laughs> that's right. And don't you think you can? Uh, you have a charism for it, right? <laughs> you, some of you, you have a way. You can do it. You're, you're strong, and that's a beautiful thing. That's a noble, good thing. St. Teresa of Avila was like that. Catherine of Siena was like that. They were strong, humble, godly women. But when something was, they knew the difference between right and wrong. When it was wrong, ho, ho. They weren't going to put up with that, and, they, and, and you don't have to. So, form and matter in the Eucharist. You've got plain bread, you've got plain wine. Then something mysterious happened. Jesus, the high priest, through the ministry of his ordained priesthood, Jesus says, take this, all of you, and eat it. This is my body which will be given up for you. Take this, all of you, and drink from it. This is the cup of my blood, the blood of the new and everlasting covenant. It will be shed for you and for all, so that sins may be forgiven. Do this in memory of me. The words of consecration, the most powerful words in the universe, words of the eternal Word, the Word who became flesh and dwelt among us. And at those words, that plain bread, that plain wine, is changed in substance into the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ. It is no longer bread and wine. The appearances, the accidents, as we say, uh, the sense perceptible, part of it. It still smells like wine, tastes like wine. It still tastes like bread. It looks like bread. It has a consistency. All those external things stay the same. But the substance, the essence of what those things are changed, it is now Jesus himself. Body, blood, soul, and divinity. And any part of it, one drop of the precious blood. It's not wine. Don't call it wine. It's the precious blood. One fragment, one crumb of the consecrated host. It's not bread. The body of Christ. It is changed in substance, and the change is permanent. I was almost thrown out of my vocation because of it. Another example of how people who often have vocations are drummed out of the core because they don't go along with a false set of beliefs. 
there are a large and significant number of people in the church, including some priests and bishops and theologians, who don't believe what the church believes. And they have pressed their secret agenda for years. Now they will deny they're liars. And if you call them for it, they'll deny it to your face. But in the next breath, in a meeting among themselves, they openly talk about it. I've been there. You know, when you're a seminarian or a layperson, they patronize you and say, you don't know anything, you don't understand theology. I will never forget it. When I was first starting, before I went, I knew these things intuitively. I knew Jesus is there. Hey, my, my, the sisters in third grade taught me that. Jesus is there in Holy Communion. That's not bread, that's the Lord. I knew that when I was a little kid. So did you. I remember one very liberal feminist sister said to me, you don't understand theology, you have no, under, you have no education. <clears throat> and so I went and earned five university degrees, including a doctorate, summa cum laude in sacred theology, came back and said, oh, well now he's got education, a lot more than you, sister. But he does, he's, he's too conservative. There's always an excuse. Plain bread, plain wine, at the words of consecration, changed into the body, blood, soul, and divinity of the Lord Jesus Christ. And falling down, we adore him. And to fail to do so is a failure in faith. To fail to acknowledge that reality is a terrible error. It strikes at the heart of the faith. Now, in case you don't know, let me tell you what's going on. There is a violent, effective, pernicious attack on the priesthood and the Eucharist. Why is there an attack on the priesthood? To get rid of the Eucharist. No priest, no Eucharist. And the attack comes on several fronts. We're seeing one dimension of it in these days. The enemy has been working on priests themselves to dishearten them, to discourage them, to destroy them morally. Are some of us guilty? Guilty as sin. Then the attack comes on other fronts, just like a good military commander, the enemy, the devil, he's a strategist, a tactician, he knows what he's doing. And so he strikes on several fronts, very well orchestrated, brilliant tactics. But it's not going to work, because in the end, the church will still be standing tall. Some of us may have fallen in the dust, perished in the battle, but when the dust settles and the smoke of battle is blown away, the church is going to be standing. For the church, remember, is the body of Christ, and you can't whip Jesus. Not going to happen. So, the priest, at consecration, Jesus through the priest, the bread and wine becomes body, blood, soul, and divinity, and it's permanent. It's permanent. I almost lost my vocation, was almost thrown out because abuses of that reality were taking place and I protested. I always had more zeal than brains. <laughs> you know, uh, novices like children are better seen than heard. You know what I mean? And there, the, the Blessed Sacrament where I was was they were not purifying the sacred vessels at, at the time, some of the priests. They put, them, they put Jesus away in the closet, and that bothered me. And so I would sneak in there and purify the vessels, and one day I was aggravated by it. I lit all the benediction candles, knelt down, and made a holy hour in the sacristy. <laughs> Provincial came in and said, what are you doing? And I said, well, you guys put Jesus away in the closet. I thought I'd make a holy hour. Somebody ought to. 
I was history. They gave me an hour to get out of town. But God is God. And Our Lady brought me to the seminary, and now they have to watch me on television. A certain vocation director, when I was trying to get in the seminary, wrote a scathing letter and said, this man is psychologically impaired. He has myopic piety and medieval thinking. He could never be a priest. Under no circumstances are you to admit him to the seminary. I found out a year later, after I was in already a year, I found out about that letter. It was in my file. And I said, how did I ever get in here? I went and talked to the rector. I said, Father, how did I ever get in? Do you know something about a letter? And he laughed out loud. He said, we had the meeting where all the seminarians who were applying were being evaluated. And we came to your file, and the uh, vice rector said, well, it seems to be a problem. And he read it out loud to all the members of the board. And there was dead silence. And the rector said, uh, who wrote that? They said, vocation director, father so-and-so of such-and-such -such diocese. Silence. And the rector had a gavel with which he was conducting the meeting. The gavel slammed down. <laughs> Accepted. Our kind of man. So you see, if God is for you, who can be against you? But very often, pressure is exerted, and it doesn't always go that well. There's a terrible pressure, a terrible internal strife that's gone on. Everybody's afraid to talk about it. It's dangerous territory. Someone said a couple weeks ago, referring to my ministry, uh, in a crowd, they said, yes, um, Father Karapi of B&B &B Ministries. I said, huh? B&B &B Ministries? So yeah, blast and boogie. <laughs> you know, it's hard to hit a moving target. <laughs> I'm not too much of a threat because I'm not around very long. I'm here two days and I'm out of here. <laughs> and then, you know, they don't really care too much about that. It shouldn't be that way. Many seminarians have been drummed out of the core. Now it's not as bad today, thanks be to God. Things are much better and getting even better. And the quality of seminarians we have today in the church is very fine. And we've got very, some wonderful bishops and some great priests, and things are improving day by day. Even though we have all this trouble going on, things are getting better in general. They really are. I've seen it. But we've had to fight it out. We've had to struggle. Uh, men have been removed from consideration for the most inane reasons. I have a very good friend. He was a Wall Street lawyer. Brilliant guy. Went to Rome to study. And there he began to see some things that didn't look right. Inappropriate. Some homosexual behavior going on. He went and reported it to the rector who chastised him up one side and down the other. He received his evaluation at the end of the semester and he was not invited back. He was eliminated. The reason given, you are lacking in social graces. The next year, the rector was forcibly removed in the midst of a terrible scandal and it was so bad they had to shut the whole place down. That has happened more than once. Now, it's got to stop. The Eucharist is what at, is at stake. And the Eucharist is everything. Source, center, summit of the church's life. That doesn't leave out very much, does it? Source, center, summit. It's everything. No Eucharist. We're in trouble. No priest. 
nor Eucharist. Pray. Pray for vocations. Pray for your priest. Now, after the transubstantiation, the change in substance of the bread and wine into the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus, that presence is permanent. It stays. One drop of the precious blood, one particle of a consecrated host, that's the entire Christ. The entire, that's Jesus. Now you say, I don't understand that. Of course you don't. Neither do I. You don't have to understand it, you only have to believe it. And there is a radical difference between understanding and believing. There is not, there's a paradox, there's not a contradiction. There's a difference between a contradiction and a paradox. They're two different things. It's an apparent contradiction, but not a contradiction in fact. Why? Our finite mind isn't able to comprehend absolutely the infinite God. And so there are things about God and about theology we just can't fathom. That's normal. That's okay, listen. Nothing in Holy Scripture says without understanding it is impossible to please God. But it does say without faith it is impossible to please God. Faith and understanding are not incompatible, but they're not the same thing either. Faith must precede understanding. Fides quarens intellectum. Faith preceding understanding. You give the assent of faith, and then you'll begin to be given light to rationally see the wisdom of Jesus Christ in the teaching of his church. And so we have a continual presence in the Eucharist, in the monstrance, the consecrated host. Is that a symbol of Jesus? No, it's much more than a symbol. That is Jesus. You say, but I I don't understand. Under the appearance of that bread, that host, is the actual, real, true, Body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ. It is the Lord. But they say, yes, but God is everywhere. Amen, brother. God is everywhere. But I guarantee you, I'm not going to go out there, fall down and worship the maple tree. I'm not an animist. Is God everywhere? God is everywhere. It's a mode of presence. It is a way of being presence. The mode of presence par excellence. The mode of presence, the most powerful, noble and dignified, is the mode of presence by which Jesus is present to us in the Holy Eucharist. I do fall down and worship him that way. It is the Lord. It is God himself. It is real. Now, you may say, yes, but... God is really present in nature. I agree. Uh, I, I go into nature as much as I can. I love the mountains and the rivers, and God is in nature. I find God in nature. I don't know about you, but I definitely find God in nature. I've always felt close to God in beautiful natural surroundings. That's why it's such a, an outrage to defile the environment, to pollute the air and the water. That's... that's God's creation, it's beautiful, it's good. We shouldn't mess it up. Yeah, God's there. Is he really there? He's really there. Is God really in his word, the Bible? Yes, God is really present in Holy Scripture. Is he really present in the ministers of the sacrament? Yes. Is he really present in every one of you, baptized people in a state of grace? Oh, yes, really, a real presence. Well, then, why should that be any different than a real presence? It doesn't mean that those other modes of presence are not real. But this is real, too. It is true. And here's the punchline. Substantial. There is a substantial presence in the Eucharist. What does that mean? It means that Jesus, in his very substance, his essence, the reality, it is him. That is such an enormous truth It's so big that it just doesn't sink in. 
Think about it for a minute. As one good Protestant pastor said to me once, he said, you know, Father John, I wish I believed what you believe. Well, I said, why is that, Pastor? He said, because if I believe Jesus was really and substantially present in the Eucharist like you believe, why I would come into the Catholic Church, I'd prostrate myself before the tabernacle. You couldn't pry me out of the Catholic Church with a crowbar because if Jesus is there in that way, where else could I want to be? And I said, whoa, Pastor, you're not far from the kingdom. You're more Catholic than a lot of Catholics. You just don't know it yet. He, by the way, converted. <laughs> you have in this parish and in other parishes throughout this great country, we have perpetual adoration. We, we have adoration of the Blessed Sacrament where people come in, make a holy hour, pray before Jesus in the exposed Blessed Sacrament, or Jesus in the tabernacle, whatever the case might be. That's a great thing. Believe you me, you have a gift beyond your wildest dreams in Jesus, in the Eucharist. Now, we've got a lot of problems today. We've got what's the problems in the Middle East, right? That, that's an ongoing crisis. Uh, we've got the war in Afghanistan. We've got terrorists here, there, and everywhere running around. We've got this terrible mess in the church. We've got the horrible problem of abortion on demand. We've got the terrible scourge of illegal drugs, violence, one thing after the next. And you may feel, you say, how can we deal with it? That's how. Jesus in the Eucharist, that is the answer to every question. I will never be a bishop. Thank God for small favors. <clears throat> no, I, I'm, I could never handle the job. They have the hardest job in the world. God bless the poor bishops who have to struggle uh, with, with all the problems. They have a terrible weight on their shoulders. And we must pray for them, for they have the toughest job in the world. But I'll never be a bishop. That's not my charism. But if I were, just think for a moment. If I were, let me tell you what I would do. I would come in like any military commander assigned a command. And I'd say, okay, the diocese. We've, and you've got a good cardinal here. There are many good bishops, and I know they do this in one form or another. You look at a, a diocese is a geographic area, and I would assess my sector. Aha, uh -huh. an abortion clinic over here. Another one over here, a pornography place over there. You know, you've uh, you got to do intelligence work, right? You've got to know where the enemy is entrenched. Okay, so what do I do? Okay, we've got the abortion clinic over here. Abortion is an external manifestation of an interior spiritual trauma, struggle, battle. The devil's behind it, in plain English. I would find the closest property. I'd buy it. I don't care how much it costs. I'd buy it, lease it, whatever. And then I would clean it up. I'd bring in a fire truck with holy water, probably. Got to start somewhere. <laughs> and then I would put in a chapel of perpetual adoration right next to the abortion clinic. And there my people would come in an unending procession of prayer, praying the rosary, offering reparation in front of Jesus in the Eucharist. And that prayer would ascend to heaven to the Father through Jesus in the Eucharist bringing down great grace. The devil, man, it would get too hot. He'd jump into hell. He'd go back where he came from. He wouldn't stick around. That abortion clinic would close. The pornography store would close. The people would receive graces. The battle would go well 
Jesus in the Eucharist is the answer, and I don't care what the question is, Jesus in the Eucharist is the answer. But we have not, we have not adequately responded. We have not adequate, adequately taken up this great weapon, this tool, this means. That's all our fault. When I was in the Army, the Vietnam War was going on, I went through a lot of training, and we had very good training, non-commissioned officers, and they taught us about weapons. You know, here's an M16. It fires a 223 caliber bullet at a certain such and such a velocity, et cetera, et cetera, and here's a 30 caliber machine gun, and here's a, the 60 millimeter mortar, and an 81 millimeter mortar, and here's all the weapons. The basic weapon, the, the M16, you had to take it apart, blindfolded, in the dark. Take it apart and put it back together. You had to know your weapon. You had to take apart an AK-47, uh, AK-47 rifle, yeah, the assault rifle, the, the Russian-made AK-47. You had to take that apart in the dark, put that back together, all the little pieces. Man, you got to know how that thing works to do it blindfolded. You got to know your weapons. Do you know your weapon? You got to know. Prayer, the Eucharist, the rosary. You've got to know your weapons and you got to know. What good if a soldier went out on patrol in Afghanistan or back in Vietnam or in Korea or in Europe in World War II, if he, if he, he were going out on patrol, man, and he leaves his gun in the barracks or in his tent, what kind of a goofy soldier would that be? Well, I mean, you know, come on. You've got to know your weapons, and you've got to know tactics. You've got to have tactics, and you've got to know the enemy's tactics. If you're going to get anywhere, weapons and tactics, and I'll tell you the greatest weapon, nuclear power, is the Blessed Eucharist. It is the power to defeat evil. It is the power to change the world. It's the power to change the problems in the priesthood. I'm going to tell you something. This is an absolute fact. No priest, and I love them all, I don't care how bad and how far Father has fallen. He's my brother. i got to love him. Father would have never fallen that way if he had made a holy hour every day. If he had spent that hour in front of the Blessed Sacrament every day, if he had in fact had accepted it as the source of his life, the center of his life, the summit of his life, he would have had power to resist temptation. Anybody can sin. Anybody can fall. That's one thing to sin. It's another thing to live in sin. There's a difference, a radical difference. Anyone can fall. But if you're living in closeness with Jesus, in intimacy with the Holy Eucharist, you're not going to fall permanently. You're not going to live in sin. Sin is not going to become your lifestyle. It's still something you've got to wrestle with, okay. But it's not going to defeat you. Nature abhors a vacuum. Priests, can have a very difficult, lonely life. But then again, so can married people. You don't have it easy. I know some married people who are very lonely. That's entirely possible, you know? You can be with people all the time and still be empty inside. But priests don't have a family. Oh, it's an analogy. Yeah, the church is our family. You're our family. That's true. But you go home together. We go home alone. Every day, day after day after day. You can talk to each other, husbands and wives. Who do we talk to? Now the devil has so succeeded in alienating us and dividing us, we don't have anybody to talk to. I've come at times to dread gatherings of priests because they're all bickering and fighting. It's a terrible experience. Now there are exceptions. There are some very beautiful experiences with good priests who come together as brothers and support each other. That's wonderful. 
But I'm going to tell you something. The morale and the priesthood, and I've seen it all over the country. I've preached in 49 of the 50 states, all the Canadian provinces except one, several other foreign countries. I have seen a broad cross-section of the church and the priesthood. And I can tell you, morale has never been lower. Our brothers are assailed from without and from within. The battle rages. You must pray for your priests. You must help your priest. The priest who has centeredness on the Holy Eucharist, he will never go too far astray. Even if he slips up a little here and there, he'll always come back because he'll have his balance, the center of his life. The loneliness won't overpower him because when he goes home, he can go home to Jesus in the tabernacle. And Jesus will comfort him. He'll speak to his heart, enlighten his mind, and strengthen his will. The priest will be fed by his intimacy with Jesus in the Holy Eucharist. And if the priest is thus fed, he will go forth and he will feed you. You need us. And we, we need you. So together, let's pray for each other. Let's pray for each other, and together we'll go toward home, our heavenly home. And one day, we'll be in heaven together. We'll hear the beautiful words, well done. My good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of your master's house. God bless you.